so I think we can um, we can get started. It's a uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, Dina Schaefer, and she will be talking today about uh, on uh, X-ray photon uh, correlation sp uh, spectroscopy how uh, dynamics could be probed uh, using uh, this uh, technique. She will talk a little bit, hopefully, about the achievements and the uh, future outlook. So a little bit about Dina. She um, received her specialist degree from uh, uh, MEFI, uh, which is the uh, National Research Nuclear University in, in Moscow. It's, it's a pretty good university. And, uh, and then she got a PhD from, uh, from Hamburg, University of Hamburg, where she worked on uh, coherent X-ray uh, scattering and application to physics. She also um, did a, a lot of work on X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy and some cross-correlation analysis. Then she did a postdoctoral research with, uh, with uh, Stefan uh, Ruskevich uh, in, uh, at Argon, MSD. And then uh, she also worked a little bit more in XPCS and also developed some very coherent diffractive imaging. She is currently uh, a staff scientist at the, the Advanced Photon Source Argon National Laboratory, where she is uh, sitting at the micro diffraction beam line that's 34 IDE. So let's welcome uh, Dina and uh, listen to what she wants to tell us. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for introduction. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me for this uh, co-work seminar. Um, so I would like today to show you that uh, uh, application of the XPCS and talk about the future of XPCS. Um, so my, here is uh, outline of my talk. I will start with a short introduction. Uh, then I will uh, say about the XPCS method and maybe showing a bit history. And uh, then I will show you a few examples of application XPCS in um, my recent studies and uh, currently going experiments. and. Um, and then I will talk about the future of XPCS. So um, uh, structural heterogeneities uh, in uh, different type materials, like for example, nanostructures in complex fluids or uh, defects like dislocations in batteries materials or also grain and grain boundaries, they are um, uh, governed the uh, different phenomena in physics and Probing that structural heterogeneities, uh, structural and dynamical behaviorism. And, and in my career, I have been probed uh, uh, soft matter uh, structural heterogeneities as well as in uh, crystalline matter. And uh, in order to probe the structure and dynamics, I mostly utilize the coherent X ray methods. Um, and uh, as have been mentioned by Dina, the most previous seminars here. Uh, was uh, dedicated to show the imaging techniques to probe uh, um, mostly crystalline matter like uh, break coherent diffractive imaging and uh, diffraction with uh, limited focus beam like um, with nano focus beam tachography methods. So um, today I would like to uh, discuss about the dynamical aspects um, and uh, I would like to do it uh, by showing you an example of soft matter. Um, which is, uh, you can imagine like, for example, nanoparticles dispersed in a liquid, uh, which is would be typical colloidal particles or more complicated nanostructures, complexes um, on the order of uh, nanometers. So, so typically they'll probe um, uh, the structure in uh, such disorder systems. Uh, we will use a uh, X-ray beam, which would uh, illuminate the sample uh, and that disorder in the system will produce a interference part pattern, which we can record in the power field using a 2D uh, detectors, for example. And uh, such a, um, <clears throat> if we use a coherent uh, X-ray beam, uh, the, that scattering pattern would consist of such a grainy structure and such a pattern would usually called also speckle pattern. And uh, the position, the, the <clears throat> the structure of the speckle pattern is um, actually relates to the uh, position of the particles in the real space. And, uh, it is hard to extract the exact structure. However, if we imagine that our real structure is changing in time, like particles is moving in the water, then uh, that uh, diffraction pattern would also mimic that dynamics. 
And if we would uh, record the fraction pattern in time and apply a certain mass to analyze this uh, patterns, the fraction patterns, that uh, we can access the dynamics uh, which will which will be connected to the uh, dynamics in the real space. And um, just for comparison, uh, why we need coherence? Uh, if we would eliminate the such a disorder uh, system with incoherent beam, typically our speckles will smear it out, and we will be able to access uh, uh, average uh, structure information like size, spacing, and isotropy of the particles. Um, so what today I would like to talk about how we can access the dynamics of the system and um, X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy um, allows us to do this. So by recording that uh, speckle patterns in time, we can construct a time correlation function and uh, the behavior of this uh, uh, time correlation function, which is usually called G2 function, is, uh, relay, can describe us what is the typical uh, relaxation time in the system, as well as uh, dependence on the wave number would uh, tell us about uh, whether uh, the behavior of that dynamics is a diffusive or collective or the Brownian dynamics. Um, so the XPCS method is um, stands along with other brilliant techniques and it's extend the <clears throat> dynamic light scattering method, which uh, um, is analog of the XPCS as well. It's extended to the much smaller scales and uh, the <clears throat> typically a time that uh, currently XPCS can probe, um, which I will show today, it can go to the microsecond regime with the current, uh, XP, uh, current uh, coherent flux at the APS source. Um, and <clears throat> a little bit uh, history of XPCS. So since the first uh, speckle pattern was uh, measured at the synchrotron in 1991, the uh, first XPCS experiment have been performed uh, in 1995 and 1996 by uh, this group of people who developed these techniques within ex and extend the yes to the X-ray X rays uh, regime. Um, so since that time there are XPCS have been applied to uh, study different types of uh, phenomena in different materials and uh, here is just a few examples uh, in which materials that uh, techniques was applied to um, probes the dynamical behavior. So um, uh, every year we <clears throat> also try to upgrade um, the capabilities of the XPCS and this happens yeah. thanks to the upgraded uh, X-ray sources over the world and also upgrade of the detector capabilities will allow us to bring the XPCS to the faster time scales and uh, probings at the dynamics at smaller length scales. Um, so I would like to show you today how the fast detector capabilities is uh, accessing the faster dynamics down to microsecond regime. Um, <clears throat> so I will, <coughs> this um, study is um, this, uh, investigated the dynamics in one of the important uh, system, which is a liquid-liquid extraction system, which is used for uh, extracting the used ions from the um, uh, industry processes and uh, this extraction of the science typically happened by um, by con by um, building this complex nanostructures in liquids and in this movie it, uh, the showing for it shows how the ions is sketched by the <coughs> made the nanostructures uh, in the liquid so this is of course just a schematic view um, and um, uh, how exactly this nanostructures uh, is uh, looking, <laughs> it's a big question still for the systems, but um, let's just study the dynamics of that. And the liquid-liquid extraction process, is, I'm showing here schematically on this uh, slide, it is based on the immiscibility of the two liquids. And uh, here you can see the red dots is representing the extracted uh, targets. Uh, and so after mixing those two immiscible liquids, there is a uh, formation of the nanostructures in the topper part, which contains the part, partially contains the extracted ions. And this you can imagine like water and oil, which would not be uh, mixing together. So uh, the 
Uh, however, uh, sometimes uh, depends on the uh, conditions uh, like uh, concentration and temperature that uh, second uh, phase may split to two phases and um, it will produce the highlight uh, um, phase and the more con concentrated ions phase, which is uh, undesired in the application processes. And how to, we can control that process, uh, we need to study the structure and dynamics and behavior of that second um, of organic phase after the extraction of the ions and how it does behave while it comes to the splitting point. Um, and this will help us to design a new uh, extraction molecules to make a, a process with better efficiency. So, uh, here is a, a very simplified uh, schematic phase diagram of that uh, organic phase after the ions have been extracted. And um, in order to bring uh, that system closer to the critical point where this phase splitting happens, we are cooling the system in experiment. And um, on uh, reaching the critical point uh, in the system, the, <coughs> um, the critical fluctuation is occurred and uh, the dynamics of that system is supposed to ch uh, be cha changing uh, by, while we're cooling this. So this system is, uh, is a multi-component system and um, its behavior, the dynamical behavior may also affect by different, um, different structures of extractant molecular or different composition. Uh, however, we try to be uh, at the critical composition by uh, choosing the extractant fraction, which is the most, uh, seems to be very able to, to, to find the critical composition of the system. And uh, so this critical point dynamics uh, and structure and dynamical description at the critical point is also important, uh, not only practically, but also important for the fundamentally <clears throat> uh, for, the, for the description of the theory phenomena. Um, and so in the, we performed the XPCS experiment at the API at the APS. Um, and uh, here is a, a parameter of the um, experiment. So we used the 11 kV and uh, <clears throat> we record the uh, diffraction pattern in the far field. Um, the beam size was um, uh, take the, the we were slitting our beam in order to uh, choose a coherent portion of the beam, which is uh, typically beam size in XPCS experiment is now on the order of several uh, microns to tens mic micro sorry micrometers. Um, so, <clears throat> and uh, what is important is uh, here we used um, uh, recent uh, recently developed and already upgraded uh, and commercialized uh, fast uh, X-ray camera, uh, which uh, can do exposures of uh, 20 microseconds in a continuous mode, and it can, in general, achieve faster in a burst mode regime. Um, so, as you can see here, um, our typical single diffraction pattern is actually consisting by one photon events, and uh, if uh, this uh, scattering signal is averaged over the uh, thousands of patterns, um, then you can see a typical uh, small angle X-ray scattering signal, uh, which is uh, as an isotropic, uh, isotropic behavior. So uh, we first, in analysis, uh, first we probe the uh, structural properties by looking in the time average signal and uh, by analysis averaging of the, over the different uh, wave uh, vectors Q, uh, we obtained the uh, intensity profiles, and uh, on this slide, I'm showing that intensity profiles um, increase uh, in, in the signal intensity profiles increases as we go to the uh, critical point. So we can imagine that we have a nanostructure complexes so as as we go to the critical point. Uh, there is there are building uh, there are more uh, building the kind of aggregation or they increasing in the size. So that's why we have a increase in our uh, scattering signal. And um, so we were able to describe uh, that uh, intensity signal um, at different temperatures within the uh, critical phenomena theory. Uh, the critical phenomena theory described the, um, uh, describes the behavior in the different uh, uh, systems by a set of uh, defined uh, critical exponents. Uh, like, for example, the um, phase transition in liquids and the uh, for example, the magnetic um, ferromagnetic uh, 
transitions can be described within one system, but with a set of exponents, and this exponents would have a different uh, constants, for example. So in our case, we were able to describe the uh, the the uh, behavior, uh, static behavior of the system at different temperatures within the uh, 3D Ising uh, model, and we found a good agreement with the uh, standard uh, exponents. And also, what is interesting that our multi-component system is actually behaving like a binary system, so that um, there is some parameters that can can simplify our system. Like for example, the instead of uh, considering all of the five components, there is only uh, two components and affect that uh, behavior. And uh, by doing such a, uh, analysis. Uh, and we, we were able to rescale all of the data to the one single master curve, which is uh, typically would be within the critical phenomena theory. So <clears throat> then for uh, discovering the dynamics in the experiment, in order to obtain uh, the enough statistical averaging in order to calculate the uh, G2 function, we had to record a lot of uh, sketch patterns in time. So. Uh, each of the, um, so the detector camera, the camera was working in the continuous mode and the recording was happening in the way that it was recording the one batch, which will consist of uh, 200,000 patterns in time. Uh, then there is a delay in order to uh, record all of the images and like a, a second delay and then it starts working again and record the next batch. So. At a different temperature, we have a different scattering signals. That's why uh, in order to obtain the uh, G2 function, we need to average over several repetitions and depends on the scattering signal, this uh, batches number will vary between uh, 200 to 500. And um, <clears throat> we analyzed the, the dynamics at the different uh, uh, wave numbers. Um, so you can see with uh, increasing the wave number, uh, we obtain uh, the much uh, faster decay in the uh, G2 function, which is uh, uh, expected since if you go to the higher queue, you probe uh, smaller length scales and dynamics on the smaller length scales would, would be appeared to be faster. So um, <clears throat> in order to uh, extract the relaxation time of the system, we fitted this uh, G2 uh, function data with uh, exponential decay. And uh, there are uh, three parameters in this function. It's uh, parameter B, which is uh, called as a baseline, which is usually close to one. Uh, the yeah. parameter beta, it's uh, called contrast. And uh, this is uh, usually depends on the properties of the coherent beam. And uh, in our case, so we had a 10% uh, contrast. And uh, tau is a relaxation time, uh, which describes uh, um, uh, time of the system at different length scales. And uh, here I present the uh, extracted um, uh, correlation time uh, as a function of uh, wave number and uh, pre it's presented for different temperatures. And you can see that the behavior of that uh, time at the different wave numbers and some temperature is different. So as we um, decrease the temperature and going closer to the critical point, we see the change of that um, slope in the uh, Q dependence of tau. And uh, this slope is represents as the Z effective, which is uh, another critical exponent in the uh, dynamical critical phenomena theory. And um, we found again a good um, um, consistent with the critical phenomena theory within a certain model, which shows that the Z effective is changing from two to three as the system is approaching the critical point. Um, so, so again, as a, for static data, we were able to rescale our uh, our uh, relaxation time uh, presented here as a reduced diffusivity coefficient uh, to a one curve. And uh, what is um, remarkably by doing the fast XPCS probing the microsecond uh, dynamics, which you can see here uh, that we were probing mic microsecond regime times. Uh, we were able to probe the critical behavior, which is on on the uh, scale plot would be the uh, <clears throat> here it's presented as a reduced uh, wave number and reduced uh, time. So the it in the critical 
closer to the critical temperature, it's uh, above the uh, x equal one. So uh, by doing the faster probing time scales, we were able to stay far away from the uh, critical points in terms of the uh, temperature. So we were able to be several degrees away, not in, we already seen the uh, critical behavior. Um, by by probing the faster time scales at their uh, larger q um, so with this uh, we were able for the first time to describe uh, within the uh, critical phenomena theory that's interesting behavior of the the liquid liquid extraction system and uh, we showed that with uh, um, efficient analysis um, the, and the availability of the high speed detectors, we are able to probe uh, microsecond dynamics um, in fluids. So, uh, the particular outlook for this uh, work is uh, we are considering to probe dynamics across different compositions, and we have been recently also found that by just changing a different extractant molecular uh, type and uh, going from different ions extraction across the lanthanide uh, series, uh, it is still showing that the system would behave as a two component system, which is very interesting. And um, we also consider to probe, um, uh, sorry, sorry, we, we consider to probe across the whole series of lanthanides. And um, we're also doing uh, MD simulation, uh, which uh, will help us to connect uh, uh, with the experimental data and the application of uh, machine learning is also considering in order to bring to breach the uh, time scales and length scales that can be accessible in experiment and in in the uh, md simulation so um, i have shown you example of probing the dynamics in the disorder <coughs> in the soft matter and um, can mm -hmm. we do xpcs with a crystalline matter so and the answer is yes um, so we can perform the uh, express and reflection type experiment and um, i would like to show you on uh, just a few slides uh, a results of a uh, uh, recent work uh, recent experimental results which we probed uh, in a wide angle xpcs uh, in a around the conditions uh, uh, in situ experiment uh, on the relaxer spheroelectrics so relaxer spheroelectrics it's um um, crystalline material uh, with uh, interesting properties and uh, dependence of the electric constant on a uh, uh, driving uh, frequency external uh, field, and this will span between the uh, between the hertz and megahertz regimes. And uh, it also uh, has a remarkable uh, temperature dependence. And uh, this material is usually used a lot in electronics um as like for example fast uh, memory devices um and uh, in the in, in the uh, recent uh, studies uh, have been shown that this microscopic properties is uh, correlates with uh, distinct diffuse scattering and uh, diffuse scattering it is um, uh, in a simple way explanation this is a uh, um, uh, everything which is uh, not a uh, coming to the Bragg scattering, so the near near the Bragg scattering exists this um, diffuse scattering, which would come from the um, not uh, regular um, uh, crystal crystal lattice uh, de defects and so on. So, <clears throat> however, um, in, it is still uh, unknown what is uh, how we can explain the uh, distinct behavior in the diffuse scattering which cause the different microscopic properties in the relaxer sphere electrics. The problem is that uh, static diffuse scattering does not uh, distinguish between a different uh, MOS, like uh, several different models was developed to try to describe the behavior of the relaxers. Uh, and thus, uh, that's why we think about to probe the dynamical behavior. Uh, I have to say that uh, thermo equilibrium um, XPCS studies have been also performed on uh, uh, different types of uh, ferroelectrics, and uh, it has been shown that the uh, speckle pattern is mostly static. So it does have uh, very slow dynamics. And it again, doesn't help us to distinguish between theories. So that's why we think if we will apply external stimulus and probe the dynamics with XPCS, under different conditions of that external stimulus, like for example, changing the electric field shape and uh, amplitude, 
uh, it will help to build additional information uh, for will make additional information for building the theory about the models of the relaxers. And here is just a one slide of uh, recent data that we collected. Um, so <clears throat> this is um, showing the reflection type experiment um, uh, in a wide angle XPCS. So we probe the diffuse scattering uh, by illuminating with a coherent beam and putting our detector near the 002 scattering. So uh, the material that we used is a classical uh, PMN, um, relaxer sphere electric. And uh, here is uh, mentioned the beamline parameters. So the electric field uh, variation in our parameters. And I would like to show you the another uh, uh, result uh, presenting for dynamical data is a uh, two time correlation function. So in the previous uh, result in general, we can also collect the two time correlation function. Uh, typically we would do it for the good scattering signal uh, in the XPCS experiment. And uh, uh, here the T1 and T2 on, on this plot is showing this X and Y axis. And uh, you can see um, the bottom of this plot, I'm showing that uh, it, it was applied a sinusoidal signal of electric field. And you can see that the correlation results is uh, following that uh, periodicity of that uh, uh, of that uh, sinusoidal periodicity. And uh, it is very interesting first observing that we actually used the uh, uh, electric field, uh, which was uh, very uh, small compared to the typically would uh, um, field which would uh, help to pull the atoms in that materials. They, they will be on the order of uh, kilovolts per centimeter. So, and um, uh, it is very interesting that applying such a small field, we have observed a, a response on our sign and return memory effect. <clears throat> so we are still working on investigation of that properties. Um, so I, I just want to show you that uh, it is also uh, possible to do not in the uh, disorder soft matter, but also in the crystalline matter. Um, in the following, I would like to discuss the future of the XPCS. Um, so, of course, uh, upgraded X-ray sources and faster detectabilities uh, will help to bring and extend XPCS to the faster time scales and uh, probing smaller length scales. And uh, since this is because if we XPCS signal as you saw the mass that it's a uh, um, it's a um, uh, it, it, it is square as a as a brightness of the source. Um, because we have a intensity multiplied by intensity in the formula, right? So then, um, <clears throat> and it will help us, I think, with the upgrade of APS, uh, at least uh, I know that we still able to probe the nanosecond time scale as far as we will have um, detectors that will able to probe that uh, better to be detectors for, for the fast averaging and so on. But also we will have an increased signal. Uh, what we need to consider for the future is this, uh, we need to consider with a higher brightness, uh, um, uh, we might have X-ray effect on the sample, like uh, sometimes in, X in XPCS you need to consider uh, damaging from X-ray or uh, X-ray can uh, change the dynamics of your system. And um, we need to also create analysis pipelines, uh, which is, uh, will require to handle all of this uh, a uh, huge amount of data which will be recorded with a fast detector and since the flux will be increasing we don't need to, we will not need to have a, a, a fast exposure time um, so so um, with upgrade and increased flux we can also consider that we can crop our beam to the smaller sizes so we, we can also focus our beams um, and uh, this will help to um, probe that um, differentiate the dynamics across the, uh, especially in our system. So decreasing the beam size, we will increase the lateral resolution in our uh, experiments. And uh, uh, however, we need to consider again, the same problems of uh, preventing the sample damage. Um, so I, I, I very much like that uh, there is a going uh, a simulation studies uh, done by Dina here. So that's, uh, she showed how, uh, how by uh, probing uh, different regions in uh, such a model system, uh, which uh, has a different flows of uh, particles across uh, the system and uh, which 
So this example can be considered as a liquid jet of the system, which would have a faster in the center of the liquid jet and maybe slower on the sides. So, and it, she showed how that um, in this work, it's shown how the different uh, time scales is found across the uh, system. And also uh, in the previous work, for example, have been done to probe the uh, magnetic dynamics uh, by Oleg Sporkor. So the typical size is about uh, 10 tenths of microns. Uh, if we would focus our beam to probe at different positions of the sample, we may consider to find a different type of uh, uh, dynamics relaxation uh, by separating the dynamics of different domains, faster and slower domains. Um, what is uh, also needs to be considered in this case is this is a, a beam position stability in order to probe all these dynamics from the same uh, sample spot. Um, another huge uh, area of applying CCS, uh, of course, is uh, uh, also to the free electron lasers. And uh, this is, um, I will not talk into the, in the details, but there have been a lot of studies have been uh, already showing uh, that it's possible to apply XPCS as, as a uh, conventional way. Um, and um, as a recent work at the European XFL uh, with uh, silica no, nanoparticles, it has been shown the huge amount of uh, correction work for the detectors, as well as uh, uh, they have been showing that uh, with the increasing number of pulses, uh, there is a, uh, the, 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 the number of pulses would uh, increase the temperature in the system uh, however, they have been shown that uh, there is no damage to the system. It's just, just uh, showing the speed up of the uh, dynamics, which is correlates with the uh, diffuse, diffuse dynamics uh, by analyzing with the uh, uh, Einstein coefficient, diffuse, diffuse uh, coefficient. So there is a, a several different techniques to analyze the dynamics at the uh, free electron laser, like split and delay pulse techniques, uh, where the, um, the diffraction pattern of uh, split it, uh, uh, FEL shot will be recorded in one uh, diffraction pattern. And by wearing the delay of that uh, splitting, uh, we, can, we can achieve the different contrast in the diffraction pattern. And by analyzing, uh, by changing the delay, uh, delay uh, we uh, can see how interest is changing of, depends on the dynamics in the system. Um, so, uh, the the one point that uh, needs to be also considered is analysis methodology for for example by dental XPCS at FELs since uh, also every every uh, shot in the X file pulse is not uh, um, is not identical like is mostly varying a lot uh, going from weak to strong so here is an example of weak simulated patterns by Yukawa so of uh, weak and strong pulses and uh, uh, we are trying uh, in in this paper. We are showing how the proper analysis and um, weighted uh, G two function algorithm, uh, showing how to use the noise in the obtained G two function. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank uh, people with who I'm working on different XPCS projects, and I also would like to thank my uh, first supervisor and the Erfurt group for introducing me to this XPCS technique. And thank you for your attention. All right. Um, thank you very much, Dina. Thanks for the uh, extremely amazing talk and insight into XPCS. Uh, we're going to welcome everyone right now to, uh, to ask questions and uh, if not, some discussion. So the floor is open. Edwin, uh, this is Ian Robinson here. All right, Ian. Please um, go ahead. Yeah. Thank, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, definitely. Sure. Um, uh, hi, Dina, and thank you for a very clear talk and very nice slides that you sent there. I'm going to bug you for some references uh, in, in, in a few minutes. Um, uh -huh. I was uh, curious about the, I think this is the best example to date of the studying of, of a true critical uh, phenomenon uh, with XPCS. And I was curious about the exponents that you're getting because the normal diffusion exposure exponent is Stokes law that gives an, a slope of two to the uh, life, the, the uh, decay time versus Q. And what you're seeing is, is well, you're seeing two only at the very, f very furthest temperature range on, on the very yeah. far right hand side. But most of the time it comes out as a slope of three. 
And I'm wondering what the slope of three corresponds to microscopically. What's happening to the diffusion? Is it strongly caged or is it collisional? Is, is there something uh, long range happening in the, in, in, in the process? Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting. So I, I would uh, say that uh, we definitely could say that it's uh, different from the, uh, from the Brownian dynamics as we, you, you mentioned that it's kind of close to two. So we already <laughs> even, yeah. So I would, I would think that it's maybe a mixture of the uh, com complex dynamics in the system. And so, um, so far as I, as, as we did this experiment, we have never observed the, uh, uh, kind of a different exponent going like it was kind of 3.02 was like this was a maximum that we observed. So this is I think it's a it's a complicated dynamics and mixture and it would be this is what we're trying to figure out by doing the uh, dynamical simulation. There is a new type of uh, coarse coarse grain a type of simulation and other we try to bring our our length scales. Uh, of the simulation box closer to the experimental uh, experimental data, and as far as we see in the simulation, we see that mostly it is uh, uh, growing and uh, collapses of the micelles. So um, I would expect that it's a it's a it's a collective dynamics uh, of the of that um, nanostructures complexes, and uh, again, as I mentioned, that the, the some of the people in this liquid extraction system consider that it's a micelles, but uh, actually it is not uh, fully known yet what is exact structure. It can be also uh, like a polymeric, uh, uh, polymeric sheets, like, like for example here, they can be not as a, as a micelles, uh, not like circle objects and so on. They can just make a complicated structure there. Um, it, yeah, I, it does have a very clear exponent of three. The two is more washy, but uh, it yeah. does seem to go to two at the, I guess, the highest temperatures. Um, but there's a clear region with three, and that's new. That's uh, that's a new kind of dynamics that isn't that isn't Brownian. It's something else, and it it may be maybe dynamic light scattering can can help find what gives an exponent of three. But that's uh, that's really fascinating. Yeah, in the dynamic light scattering studies, uh, they have been also shown the, uh, that the, the behavior in general would be also changing uh, to, 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 to the Z effective closer to the three. So this is happening in, this is a, also predicted in the critical phenomena theory. So, but uh, it doesn't exactly explain how and what exactly happening with the system. It is just some, uh, it, it, I, I think it's a mixture really of the of the faster, slower and collective movement of the bigger aggregates in the system. Okay, but, but it is a prediction of theory. So that's, yeah. that, that, then we should look at that theory to understand mm -hmm. what, what it means for the material. Mm -hmm. It's a, a clear behavior that you're seeing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Ian. Um, Some more questions? Yeah, um, can I, um, hello? Yeah, hello? Hi. Can I ask you, a, I mean, I have a provocative question. So for this uh, micelle or microemulsion, <clears throat> what is actually the advantage compared to DLS? Because even microemulsions and binary liquid mixtures have been very well studied by light scattering in the 80s. So what is actually the advantage of using it? XPCS mm -hmm. because near critical point everything is scaled. So even if yeah. you don't go to the smaller size scale, I mean it's scaled. Um, yeah. So I mean the advantages is uh, so I would like to show you here for example the uh, the the DLS study and uh, comparing to our uh, Z effective uh, exponent that uh, we can probe by. So the, the typical range of the Q that we access in the, uh, the X-ray experiment, it's uh, uh, 0 0.0065 Anstrom inverse. 
uh, while the maximum Q at the DLS because of the wavelengths uh, uh, typically observed is uh, 0 0.0026. So this is our usually low Q. Um, so, and uh, by, by doing at the high Q and probing the dynamics at the, at the at how how that uh, how the system dynamics is changing on a very high queue, that means that we probe a very low scales, which is at this queues would be uh, uh, very fast, even if we are uh, not at the very close to the critical point. So we are probing that critical regimes, uh, starting of that critical regime, so already further away from the from the temperature, so from the critical point. So in the scales uh, is uh, several uh, degrees uh, compared to the uh, milli degrees, which uh, usually needs to come closer to the uh, critical point in the DLS in order to start to probe that critical behavior. Uh, no, 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 not, that is not true. Because critical fluctuation in light scattering, you can see you know, tens of degrees away from the critical point. So, so that is not true. You can, you can uh, observe very far away because a uh, light the contrast is much i mean the, the uh, you know the refractive index fluctuation is much more sensitive than electron density fluctuation in the case of x rays no. so critical phenomena has been i mean if you see the old papers people go to very high very far away from the critical point you can s still see the you know the growth of the correlation length and of course in critical phenomena when you go close it is a diverging correlation length. So you, the, the size is, I mean, the relevant size is much larger. So you don't have to go to the smaller scale. Uh, so, you, so my so, question is, so is there really an advantage compared to DLS in using the, SBCS to the, study critical phenomena? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 in general, if you would probe uh, at the very far uh, of the critical point and you need to have a, a bigger scales there. So which would mean that uh, DLS might have uh, troubles with a uh, with a uh, multiple uh, scattering in the system. So the and DLS has a trouble of multiple scattering near the critical point. But of course, then, since then the methods have developed, so there is a way to suppress the multiple scattering. And so, so you know, you can also go closer. Um, so and then so also far, you have less problem of the damage. So when you study micelles and micro emissions, you have problem of uh, X-ray damage. And with the light scattering, okay, you can still have a beam heating effect, but which can be calibrated. So uh, um, I don't see a real advantage of using XPCS to study, you know, binary mixture like a critical phenomena. Um, so we first, uh, so first comment is that uh, it's a very exciting that we found that it's a kind of a binary uh, mixture while that uh, the system is like a five component system and so on. Um, so that another another comment that uh, of course uh, every techniques may have uh, some obstacles and uh, there are many brilliant papers of DLS which shows how to try to uh, develop the additional uh, subtraction of the uh, uh, background subtraction and uh, so on in order to uh, correct the uh, critical exponents and so on to achieve that uh, but uh, again, uh, by looking in the similar uh, MISO system in the DLS uh, literature, uh, to, to, my, to my knowledge that I have tried to find, uh, that I haven't found so many which uh, can show that uh, there is a critical behavior observation far away from the critical point in, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, such kind of multi-component system. There was a uh, uh, three component system, maybe uh, two studies that I now kind of uh, remember, uh, but again they have applied a lot of uh, a lot of also background correction uh, in order to correct for the uh, all of those multiple scattering effects. So, uh, no, no, but uh, I, I think, see. Uh, I mean, I can send you some literature because there's a huge mm -hmm. literature, and of course it, this is also well established what is called quasi-binary approximation in multi-component systems. So, I mean, micro emulsions and all these are multi-component systems. I mean, their critical phenomena is the same. I mean, they all follow icing like a critical exponent, like binary mixture. So this is also known from 80s. So what is called quasi-binary approximation. And uh, I mean, in the worst case, you can have what is called Fisher scaling of the exponent in multi-component yeah. uh, mixtures. Not, not, I mean, it's not so different from a, 
icing like critical exponent. So the, I mean, this this is already there in the literature in the 80s. Uh, yeah, yeah, and so yes. I mean, as as I as I mentioned, the most uh, DLS okay. literature has deals still in the uh, milli 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 uh, degrees away okay. from the critical point here, just by comparison. And uh, again, uh, there are a lot of uh, background correction applied. Didn't uh, use any background correction in our system. We estimate also the heat and damage and possible X-ray damage to the system, which uh, was uh, neglectable in our case. So that's. Uh, uh, I think a brilliant study of bringing and probing the faster dynamics at the of the low Q, and you start to 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 see the critical effect already far away from the uh, from the point. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, purpose of was uh, how why we why we want to probe the uh, dynamics of the system, and again with the uh, increasing the flux uh, by probing the. Uh, higher larger q uh larger q wavelengths uh we uh, our hope in general is to probe the also ion dynamics that may affect whether the ions is inside the mysos may be having certain uh, uh separate dynamics in in the, inside the mysos volume or those bigger complexes can have their own dynamics that's that is a goal to go with uh upgrades and probing the faster okay. dynamics. Thank you, yeah. I stop you. <laughs> I, I will be interested uh, to, to, to get uh, more literature from you that you mentioned. Yeah. Okay, I, Thank I you see, very much, uh, we'll appreciate. Peter has a question, P Peter, please go ahead. Yes, um, mm -hmm. hi Dina. Um, hi Peter. I actually, I have a similar question to what, what mm -hmm. Narayan mentioned. If you, I mean, you, if you, if you look at your transparency, uh, I think it was 25 or so, um, where you had the results from yeah. XPC, yes. from the dynamics, yes. Mm -hmm. Because there you say that um, for XPCS, you actually see a larger uh, uh, critical region. Now, I think... I see the critical behavior earlier. Yes, That's but I think I'm this thinking. is not correct yeah. because, um, I mean, for example, a long time ago in the in the eighties, we looked at uh, critical uh, phenomena with protein solutions, and and there again we used DLS, and we saw critical behavior starting at something like ten to fifteen degrees away uh, from the critical point. Everything nicely done. Uh, you see icing exponents, three D icing exponents. Mm -hmm. um, I think the point is that you actually are probably not in a good position to look at critical dynamics with XPCS once you come closer to the critical point. Because, you know, what you measure is with a, with a quasi-elastic technique is, is um, the decay of concentration uh, fluctuations or density fluctuations with wavelengths that correspond to, to, your, uh, in, to the inverse of your scattering uh, vector. And so if you come closer to the critical point, your uh, critical fluctuations grow and grow, and they sort of grow out of your Q regime that you actually have access to with XPCS. And that will possibly also give rise to some funny Q dependence because you, you see both critical as well as non-critical contributions to your dynamics. And so, in, you know, I, I, I would agree with Narayan that if you really want to look at, at, at critical dynamics, either in single or multi-component systems, whether it's microemulsions or proteins or, or, or single fluids or binary fluids or whatever, at the end of the day, I, I, I wouldn't go to XPCS to look at the dynamics. If, if you are just interested in critical phenomena, because there I think you're much better off doing this with DLS because this allows you to, to actually look at the right link scales for, for critical fluctuations. Um, I would a bit, uh, so we have a DLS in our experiment, but only as a pre-characterized uh, system to kind of uh, shortly determine where is a, which, uh, like where is a uh, critical temper. So um, in order to probe the uh, critical fluctuation there, uh, uh, so we, we had to, we, I, I have never 
at least got it by the pre-characterization. I always got a decay of G2 function, which starts to be uh, affecting by the multiple scatter for particular uh, this liquid liquid extraction systems. So um, yeah, but this, there are ways this, there are ways around this. I mean, either you either you decrease um, your scattering volume. You know, you can you can use capillary. Once you go into, towards critical phenomena, you have so much intensity that even reflexes from walls don't matter. So you can you can go to small capillaries, or you can use these cross correlation techniques that allow you to suppress multiple scattering. Um, um, so. But the point is the following. I mean, we, we again, if I, if I refer back to the experiments with that we did with proteins, um, if, you, if you look at, in this case, we looked, we combined DLS and, and neutron spin echo as, as the neutron crazy elastic technique. If you go and look at it on the link scales of neutron spin echo, you see no contribution from critical phenomena whatsoever because you only see diffusive dynamics from, from the particles on nearest neighbor length scales. If you want to pick up critical phenomena, you have to go to DLS and, and then you see that uh, dynamics is dominated by, by critical slowing down. And in your XPCS, you're some, somewhere in between. So I would still expect you to see um, some non-critical dynamics, diffusive dynamics, but you get a mixture because um, you know initially you're probably good yeah, it's, because it's you mixture. see yes, but, but but the problem is you know your your correlation links the dynamic correlation links move sort of out of your uh, scattering uh, vector uh, link scale. And so you're no longer in, 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 in probing the right um, um, decay of fluctuations because you're out of the critical um, uh, uh, link scale. No, and that the makes critical it... fluctuation would happen in, in the whole system, like as no, far as it's well, there, because I mean, you have is... always mixture. And if you go, the critical behavior here is above the one. And if you look here as close, so the blue, the colors are presenting blue is as you come closer to the critical point. So you see that critical uh, component uh, much uh, stronger here in the X more than one. If, when, when, when you would probe that uh, higher Q with a faster length scale that you see the critical component already there. So this is- uh, Is like this you, Kawasaki? You, uh, is yes, this yes, yes. Okay. Yes. But Again, I think if you, if you if you really want to to probe um, if if you want to probe, for example, dynamics close to the critical point, crit, critical dynamics uh, or critical slowing down close to the critical point or close to to spinodal, you want to pick up um, your concentration fluctuations or density fluctuations at the link scale of your um, dynamic correlation links and not somewhere in between because in between you'll get contributions from different different processes and so um, you know maybe this is something that goes beyond what what this crowd here wants to listen to but maybe this is something for so more I yeah I, I just want to in say also discussion we, later yeah yeah so we also of course uh, we, we we compared it with the DLS with the closest queue that we were able to reach at DLS so that we would be the uh, the lowest queue at the XPCS and the uh, the the high the maximum queue that we can probe in DLS so we saw the uh, good agreement by looking at the plotting that um, temperature dependence for a particular queue and uh, the data is consistent from the DLS and XPCS it's just showing for the XPCS in the uh, um, uh, for that we, with XPCS we can probe a larger queue for this and we start to see that the uh, uh, critical uh, component that is a mixture of critical and non-critical and uh, there is this critical component already far away uh, from the temp from the from the critical temperature when they when this fluctuation starts to build that's 
uh, what I what I'm trying to say. That's why uh, you already start to see it even uh, at the at the far away from the critical point by probing that smaller length scales when this critical fluctuation it starts to build. That's, like crossover, like crossover behavior plus DLS, uh, which is uh, very consistent with what we probed as well with XPCS in general, like for one particular cube that we were able to cross. Okay, I think this would require some more t more more time, and I and I think it goes beyond what what probably is the is the purpose of this of this uh, webinar. So. <laughs> I'll um, be happy, Peter, if you would uh, have time that we can make a discussion with uh, you and uh, my colleagues as well for that particular case. That would be very interesting. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll then send you the email later. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Peter. I, I think uh, Sasha um, Alexander has uh, has some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hi, Dina. Very simple Hi. question, don't worry. Uh, just about the second part, uh, you've shown that you apply the sinusoidal voltage and then you see uh -huh. sinusoidal response. So can't you see the same if you just use, for example, less coherent beam and analyze brightness or position of the break peak or its widths? Won't you see oh, simply so, uh -huh. the same effect? Why do you need such complicated analysis applied here? So, uh, yeah, at, as kind of we were we were actually surprised in general if you just sum intensity here you it depends on the uh, amplitude field if you just would, would integrate uh, the intensity over that uh, diffuse peak you would start to see already that uh, uh, oscillin but uh, so imagining that you would have this is um, kind of showing that example that you can apply here we didn't know exactly what to expect at this small field as, as well so uh, but uh, generally, closer to the break peak, you see the static behavior. So you don't see response on on, on the on the sinusoidal field, and uh, the most the your, your your two time correlation function would be just a bright showing a static behavior. Um, and for this particular system, the, the scattering signal is quite uh, uh, good for us. So that in principle, uh, you you kind of want to. You can you can see that response over that whole uh, diffuse uh, peak pattern. However, since you see the speckles of this diffraction pattern, which would uh, um, def uh, reflect the um, that uh, structure, like the main structure in your system, we were thinking about also that there might be different uh, dynamical behavior if it would analyze a uh, uh, different part of that diffuse peak. So. Um, this this is this why that's why we were hoping that uh, XPCS will show some interesting uh, interesting uh, observation in the system. Yeah. Okay, so basically you expect to get more information from those speckles than you already have, right? Yeah, yeah. And so actually, like I was, yeah, there is I was no, trying. Sorry. Sorry. Go. Yeah, I'm listening. Sorry. Uh, so I was trying to analyze, uh, for example, how the how the uh, especially the, uh, the the center of mass in different in different speckles would be moving, and what would cause in in general whether it's a changing intensity of the speckles or if it's in in, in itself this intensity within speckles would change to produce this. So it is still ongoing analysis. I I can definitely say that the, the oscillation disappear as we go closer to the break peak. Uh, however, we also consider that. It, uh, from where this actually effect comes, because we we now trying to consider whether X-ray also may apply some additional uh, effect to the system. So that's why I'm just showing that it's uh, interesting as an experimentally type of experiment uh, and for lower scattering signals, it's uh, maybe also interesting to, to apply XPCS for different speckles and different domains to extract different types of dynamics. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Sasha. Yeah, I think we have a couple of uh, uh, questions. There is Alex, but just before I get to Alex, just uh, a quick question relating to what Sasha was asking. Mm -hmm. what, type of, uh, what type of physical phenomenon do you think is driven by these uh, tiny electric fields? You know, what's the... Um, mm -hmm. So, um, as we, ex so as I said, just mentioned that we may consider that the X-ray uh, may also affect and make a also huge uh, um, 
polarization effect also in this in the in the material so we are working in this direction too so that's why maybe the small effect small electric field applied is already um create uh, creates this phenomena by already made some um some some charges in the system uh in by causing by the, by the x-ray for example but um, what could be another theory is that um, so it's a uh, it's of course a bigger field is needed to pull the atoms and pull the domains. The another series may be possible that uh, we see some uh, not uh, flipping the um, electric, uh, not flipping of the polarization we see in the each domains, maybe smaller like uh, nanometer size, nanometer size domains, but there might be some distortion from the uh, like a circular as you would consider like a spin waves when that when for example the spin moment would be kind of rotation of the spin moment small rotations mm -hmm. um, and that small rotation would like uh, uh, change the change the polarization and slightly change the structure that would cause a difference uh, in the dif in the contrast which is actually remarkably going almost like a, sometimes a hundred percent uh, changes of the contrast in the in the analysis that we observe, yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, Alex, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alex here from uh, Max4. I, I have a super Hi. practical question. Hi. Um, Hi, thanks for a very nice talk. I, I don't know so much about XPCS, but I, I just wondered what, um, what detector do you use for this sort of tens of microns um, tau? Oh, okay. Uh, so for, for this one, it's... Uh, it's now commercialized by Rigaku, so it's uh, 75 by 75 micrometer square, so pixel size, and uh, it is. Um, uh, there are several publications about this detector. I can send you. Uh, no, I, I, it's yes, a, great. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh -huh. we, we're we're looking into this also at at Max uh -huh. and and the, the Rigaku is one of the one of the options. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's a Rigaku. It's now bigger chips detector. So this was uh, just uh, before commercializing it. So it was uh, just a. Uh, uh, a test, test still in the test mode, the uh, small camera, but uh, then they prove it by putting more chips. So now it's, I think, uh, uh, 560 or oh, even 1000 I think, pixels by, by 500. So something like that. And comes in a shiny box now. Mm -hmm. I can okay. send you the publication if you're interested later. Thank you very much. So Edwin, I feel that you're mute. Uh, All right, definitely. Sorry about that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so, so actually mine are just uh, uh, comments to the last, uh, last slides that you're presenting uh, where you're talking about uh, MID or uh, European Field Electron Laser, no? Uh -huh. uh, so yeah. just to say that actually the splitting the day line was uh, successfully commissioned uh, on the month of May. So actually in the next uh, run that is starting in July, we are going to actually do XPCS with uh, uh, PAM X-ray, X-ray to say. So this is what you were presenting. Uh, and a comment with respect to, I think you simulate, uh, or you say in the next slide, no? That you're simulating yeah. how is the, uh, the pulses. Uh, when you saw that, uh, you are taking into account the normal, uh, to say, trains of, uh, European XL or uh, how is that uh, so this, stochastic this, noise? Yeah, uh, this, this was, uh, uh, so we were taking the uh, exponential dis uh, distribution and gamma distribution of different, like simulating a different intensity in the pulses. So this is, I think we were mostly taking the SACLA also. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, not exactly particular for European Excel, but uh, so in general, yeah. in general, you would have a distribution in the in the uh, pulses of uh, FEL. So I'm not a uh, high. Yeah. I, I like I didn't make a lot of exp experiments, so it just uh, that's uh, I was uh, we were interested in terms how to analyze. Yeah. We did so, few experiments so, and was it very interesting. So, so actually, yes, uh, to mention, no, when we are doing it at European XL with our uh, train pulses, no? Uh, so mm -hmm. it, depending of uh, how many, uh, the last uh, May also, we arrived up to 1,000 pulses for the first time at MID. So, mm -hmm. uh, and actually along the trains, they are quite stable. So they are quite reproducible. 
Uh, oh, they oh, they, oh, they okay. don't depend so much of the stochastic uh, start of the machine for each single shot, but somehow inside the train they have a quite reproducible uh, uh, intensities. Uh, but in different trains, so that is every 10, uh, every uh, one, uh, open one seconds, no? Every train that is uh, coming in 10 hertz, uh, these mm -hmm. guys can really change a lot between them. But usually mm -hmm. in the same train, it's really stable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, uh, I think also know, maybe I... it's interesting for you. <laughs> uh -huh. for you. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have participated with Ian Robinson experiments at MIT. And uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I I, I kind of don't remember that time was it uh, very, uh, I don't, in, in terms of analysis, I remember we had a lot of troubles there. So it's, uh, it's yeah, different. No, it's, it's complex. We have improved a yeah. lot, I think, in the last uh, year uh, and also yeah. stability. Uh -huh. so, okay, thank uh, you. Yeah. You're welcome. Nice talk, by the way. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Engel. Um, uh, and, and just to mention, we have two postdocs for XPCS at MID if someone is in. Okay, thanks. I uh, I don't see any hand. I don't see anyone raising their hands again. So um, I think in the absence of uh, any any other question, let's thank the speaker and uh, um, uh, thanks a lot, Dina, for such uh, an amazing talk. And uh, and hopefully we'll get to hear again uh, more from you. Um, uh, yeah, I will be interested as far as I get more to the if you would be interesting about Lowe diffraction, like. I'm actually considering I'm kind of getting more and more to the Lowe micro and then the diffraction and I consider to yeah. put the uh, coherent uh, scattering methods for the sector set for E. So I'm looking for the users as well. If somebody has a bigger, bigger, oh. the bigger, some uh, structures and so on who interested to work with me. So contact me, send me emails or chat, chatting with me. So that's would be great. Yeah, definitely. Um, Thank you yeah. very much for inviting me for this uh, nice seminar. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I right, very appreciate you. it. Right, yeah, thank thanks you. for the question. Yeah. And, and I'd like to, to thank everyone who has contributed also to the discussion. Actually, uh, normally we, we close officially the session and if anyone is interested in staying a little longer, uh, I don't know if, uh, if Peter and Dina would like to take this occasion maybe to exchange emails or anything else than has been already said. Um, that's that's that it's okay. I mean, it's uh, we, we can keep it open like for a short number, yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can close it here. Or if if there is anyone else who can ask some maybe curiosity on setup, and... yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Dina, I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit uh -huh. about your, your ferroelectric relaxer if uh, you've got some time, uh -huh. like, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have a Another presentation where just shown in the APS user meeting a bit more, bit more uh, data and analysis. Uh, uh, but as I as I said, it's a just like an, uh, it's really we got an interesting interesting behavior and data, but we're still trying to understand why yeah. <laughs> yeah. why it like this. Yeah. yeah, because it's something that I've been actually interested in for quite quite some time now is uh, so you have mm -hmm. a couple of phenomenon in this relaxer of materials. You have this so-called polar nanoregions that you would expect from uh, uh, relative displacements of, let's say, niobium and, uh, and magnesium mm -hmm. atoms and stuff like that. Then you also have the, uh, the uh, ferroelectric, uh, the, the, tweet, the tweet domain. So, the, so these tweets, these are twin, twin variants that you would expect to see uh, that normally form needle-like domains. So the, the two of them actually, uh, they are competing theories that, and even some experiments that show the uh, the possibility of these uh, contributing to these relaxer properties. And these are things that you would expect to probably see with such a type of measurements that, uh, that you're looking at. And the interesting thing with the twin domains is that uh, the needle-like domains is that you need a very, very small um, amount of force or pressure to actually move them, to displace them, to move them around. So. Um, we had a paper that we published uh, maybe last year where we uh, we just did BCDI to actually look at these uh, ferroelastic tweets, uh, ferroelastic uh -huh. needle-like domains, and uh, one of our collaborators did some theory calculation just to show that the the radiation pressure coming from X-ray actually is sufficient to actually displace uh, to move around some of these uh, needle-like uh, uh, structures. So you might be actually in the ballpark they're saying that there's some sort of dynamic what, that might be coming from the x-ray. What, so. 
what kind of uh, what of a relaxer did you study? We, so we actually look at tweets at the uh, barium titanate that uh, had, mm -hmm. had, had that uh, had a little bit of enrichment with uh, zirconium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you if you dope some of these ferroelectrics with some you know some uh, uh, some acceptors or some uh, donor elements, you know, you can actually form some of these uh, uh, local sites that would, uh, you can actually uh, use them. Uh -huh. which, so where, which, which beamline did you study? Which uh, we, had, we actually we, we did this at Ross's beamline. We did uh, BCDS. Uh -huh. We didn't. We, okay. I, was, I was actually we're trying to do XPCS. We still are writing the proposal, but we'd like to do uh -huh. XPCS on this type of system to see if we can. See, say anything about uh -huh. the uh, this so-called polar nano regions and also the uh, the tweets themselves, and, and you would expect them to. I mean, they are different; they fluctuate at different uh, length scales. So you would see them at different queues. So at least that's what we are, we expect. Mm -hmm. So at higher queues, you would expect to see maybe these polar nano regions or the tweets, and then at the lower queues, maybe you will see the domains. You know, but then again, you have to just like what you did; you have to drive them with different strengths of the field. So large or strong electric field would really move the domains, you know, they, uh, or switch. Mm -hmm. the How, what, the, what the electric field you were applied there? Or did you apply it at all? Or did you were, you were showing, you said that you have a, seen a lot of uh, radiation pressure. <coughs> effect yes. That. So uh, we, we didn't apply the field in this case. We just see, we saw some effect from radiation pressure. The, the mm -hmm. ones which we applied the field, we applied fields of about, uh, I think, it, the voltage was about 20 volt, and then we had a, I can't remember the thick, the, the thickness mm -hmm. of, of the sample, I have to. May I ask you, it, where, where where did you make the sample, or did you, commercial, you got a commercial sample? Or? Uh, no, we have uh, some, color, no. I got the samples from, from Sint, from Los Alamos, so I have... Uh, so you were growing the sample? No, I, 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 was think, just wondering. I think Chen is a collaborator in Los Alamos, he grew, he grew the samples for, uh, for us. Mm -hmm. I see, because we were kind of uh, struck with, uh, in general, sample preparation for the experiment, like mm -hmm. <clears throat> we were, got some sample which was grown, some samples which were uh, cut it from the commercial and polished and also making a contacts on the site, so everything yeah. was so, <clears throat> we improved like every experiment, but mostly what we were improving, the technical details, like in terms of the preparation and the uh, uh, aligning and so on. So, uh, yeah, a, a part of the analysis that <laughs> took a lot yeah. of time to make a proper sample preparation. Yeah. Um, so, but it's, Edwin, it's, I have a short, I have a short work. question for you. Yeah, yeah uh, Dima, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, this this switching you say because of the beam pressure, is it related to the ferroelastic behavior of BTO or not? It is related what? to the ferro. Yeah, it's it's related. So ferroelastic. So yeah, it's ferro basically the twin twins switching there. This is what you think. Yeah, that's that's what we think. And we have uh, I mean, one of our collaborators. He's he's working on the theory. So he he actually he showed that um, with a small force of uh, I I can't remember of just a, of a, a few picot newtons is sufficient enough to actually uh, displace some of these uh, these. Mm. Uh, uh, this, uh, of course, you have different lens, different, there's a little bit of a mesoscopic lens scale of this uh, ferroelastic uh, domain. So, but it's. But it's specific it's, for barium titanite. It's yeah, this is specific for barium titanite. Okay. I, don't, I don't know, you know for this, uh, for PMN, it would be very interesting to, to do the, to do the, the Landau calculation. And yeah, interesting if it differs a lot, because recently we published a paper where we used the twinning switching by I AFM, see, yeah. and it took a lot of force to do this. Yeah. So it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So so one thing that we're actually considering right now is that um, there's a, Sohe came up with a paper that shows that if you can display some of these tweets, uh, it's possible to displace the polar ions and then create magnetic fields. So. So this is uh, a, another approach of harvesting uh, magnetism from. Uh, from systems that are from oxides, I mean complex oxides that do not predominantly have any magnetic uh, atom or ion in it, so something like that. So just by displacing this uh, elastic uh, domains, right? So I would, yeah, I would, uh, 
I, I, I will send you an email, Dina, just to. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it would to be do, very interesting. Yeah, to, I, I, yeah. Because we start to kind of uh, with the sphere electrics, uh, like for me, this material was new. I was uh, joining uh, mostly this project as a postdoc, and I continue working. And it uh, was very exciting to learn about the sphere electrics at the beginning, then figuring out that there are so many theories. That <laughs> it's yeah. it, it is it is like a so long years problem as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, everything would be helpful. To, to figure out what this cost. And if you're interested in uh, the XPCS or like the stuff, so I, I will be very interested also to join and see well, how it, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's. Definitely. Um, I, I was sending an email, we, we, we actually, I did, we did some XPCS measurement at, uh, at sector eight. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for for, for on, on on copper oxide actually copper oxide is mm -hmm. expected to be uh, uh, it's reported to have uh, magnetoelectric uh, properties and uh, between mm -hmm. uh, to between two to, from two hundred and thirteen Kelvin up to um, I think two thirty this window is uh, supposed to be ferroelectric and then this ferroelectric window is uh, has some sort of uh, commensurate. Um, uh, behavior with uh, with uh, with uh, with an antiferromagnetic phase, an AFM AF one and AFM two phase, and mm -hmm. literally what what we did in this experiment, uh, we we just we just did a normal uh, heating and cooling. We we you know we cool it down to about I think maybe eighty Kelvin, and then heat it up again to room temperature, and then we we're, we're doing XPCS. Then, but the interesting thing is that we have some data some data that we start seeing some sort of uh, emergent something that we, so we see some structure coming in. So initially, you get you get the traditional speckle patterns and stuff like that. Then, once you hit that uh, that ferroelectric window, and you see you see some stripe-like features coming in at, and a little bit at, at higher cues. So it's yeah, it's kind uh, of like a memory effect from the yeah, uh, yeah. from the previous uh, yeah. temperature. I think that's yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, something that I would I would like to discuss it with you and maybe. Uh, get a little bit of understanding of. Um, I haven't been. I haven't done XPCS. Uh, I've always wanted to, but I haven't. I just started getting yeah. into XPCS the, the past couple of years. So, yes, yeah, so there is additional aspects when you try to do with a different temperature. Like for example, um, also this ferroelectric. They have a, also temperature dependent. So we choose a PMN, and we usually now performing a room temperature experiment. So mm -hmm. we are considering also to try um, wearing the um pt component uh which will shift that uh, that uh, dielectric constant dependence uh at the in the temperature range a lot and uh so for some of the materials you need to like cry a temperature for some of them you need to heat it up so it's we 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 looking forward also to investigate the temperature behavior but so far we just re realized this behavior and trying to understand this before going forward. But yeah. We consider also tem different temperature behavior might also affect this kind of uh, different memory and so on. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. That's another interesting uh, direction to probe. <laughs> I think yeah. it will also help for for building the theory model. Um, yeah. yeah, you. Kyle, he's uh, currently also trying to model this kind of speckle pattern. So because itself, that speckle, speckle pattern is also interesting. We see some small speckles, which is like one pixel size, but we see also bigger features in it. So which would we think that it's kind of uh, uh, like a pudding, like rising pudding, have a bigger, maybe bigger domains with smaller domains in it. Like that's mm -hmm. uh, uh, another possibility, but I will, Still trying, trying to understand the structure as well as. Yeah, uh, did, I did think sim the, the the simulation did, experiment would. Definitely yeah, did, help. You, did you see the same behavior for for a different uh, reflection? Let's say for. Yeah, yeah. we we saw the um so the, yeah, the the setup that we used uh, allowed us in unfortunately to go only. Like we we tried at zero zero one as well, and we saw the similar response. At zero zero one and uh, one zero three peak, we also try. Uh, unfortunately, due to this uh, kind of a setup, we were able to access uh, only a few uh, 
few uh, diffraction peaks there. So because the the original setup, I can show you if you can see, you will be interested to perform at 8 ID. Yeah. Did, did you get any beam time for that uh, XPCS experiment already, or? Yeah, we already we already did, we 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 had uh, mm -hmm. we had two measurements already for the 8 ID. Oh, uh, okay. On, on copper oxide. So I don't know exactly which setup you were using. Let me find that. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yes, something I was asking Eric about is if there's ever going to be a possibility of having a magnetic field, you know, for, you know, with... Uh... Oh, yeah, <laughs> magnetic field. I, I don't know exactly if they have a magnetic type of setup. So we used the, we used the one that... Uh, allowed the, to hit the sample so um, mm -hmm. they have a cryo cryo setup that uh, I think can go like uh, 70 degrees so that's uh, will be possible with a cryo setup I think and it's a uh, busy beryllium dome on it so you can access more more angles so in our case we use this one which has a water cooling and uh, it's kind of a uh, disc roundish so the sample is sitting so th this is a incoming beam and there is a very small um, arc arc kind of window with a certain uh, width window so and, and it's it doesn't allow us a lot of in kite direction we yeah. we were able to move the um, sita this is a two sita so but the kite direction was limited and uh, <clears throat> um, yeah so that was kind of tricky. We were hoping to use a cryo setup next time to see. And uh, yeah, so we we were kind of mapping the diffraction peak. So this is a butterfly uh, diffuse scattering. So we probe it, we go over the two uh, different direction of that uh, butterfly. So we were catching the two wings. And uh, then, as I mentioned here, like if I go closer to the Bragg peak, um, mm -hmm. That's a, I don't see the response on the field. We also saw a <clears throat> different kind of response on the um, asymmetric square wave. Mm -hmm. So we applied not only sinusoidal, we applied the asymmetric square wave to see. And uh, uh, yeah, here is a little bit more. So we saw also the uh, different uh, behavior in the, the relaxers depends on the increasing amplitude. So it gets uh, kind of linear to nonlinear regime. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so as far as I was going, I was trying to analyze like where is that, uh, where is this uh, kind of decorrelation comes into this uh, periodicity. So I was trying to look at the uh, special cross correlation analysis of uh, different patterns and see how the how the, um, how the center of mass in general changing, <clears throat> mm -hmm. mostly changing within that and that. Uh, it shows that it's uh, the, 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 that the center of mass in general is a small, which picks uh, speckles like would shift uh, in the direction. So I'm trying now to analyze this in terms of the Q space and figure out what is in the Q space it's shifting, to see whether it's a uh, red one. So, but yeah, so you, I, I don't know exactly which uh, sample chamber you expect, but if you would go for this one, kind of that mm -hmm. uh, doesn't have a lot of out angles. And, uh, I think unfortunately I don't have a picture of another sample chamber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, but you can ask Eric. Uh, Eric. No, ask Eric. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If you have any question about the uh, kind of I developed the data idea, I usually using uh, some of my codes, but they have a very good uh, uh, pipeline analysis as well. So yeah, which you can directly apply and see. That's nice. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely <coughs> touch with you with the analysis of. Um, of uh, yeah, sure. Feel free. <laughs> that we have. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. This is this is this is quite interesting. 